Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Herbert Spohn, uh, who is going to talk about uh, hydrodynamic scales of integral many particle systems. Thank you very much, Manas, for this introduction. So I'm I'm very happy to be here at the ICTS. I mean, it was a break of three years, which looks like a very long time, and I'm happy to be back. And I'm doubly happy to celebrate the scientific achievements of Deepak. I'm, you know, for his, all his work and uh, certainly, you know, the highly deserved Boltzmann medal. So my congratulations. So uh, I take the liberty to talk about a topic which sort of looks like almost to the opposite of what was announced. I mean, this is a conference supposedly on complex systems, and I will talk about something which people would think sort of the exact opposite of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, uh, complex dynamics, but uh, I hope you find it still interesting. So, um, so this is uh, uh, about the integrable many particle systems. So these are fine tuned systems. I mean, so these are systems which have uh, an extensive number of conserved quantities. And uh, as soon as you change, uh, you know, the model a little bit, I mean, you will immediately lose this property. We also have you want to sort of uh, the drawback that we are automatically in one space dimension. I mean, there's just in higher dimension, of course, some activities, but not so much. And certainly nothing in terms of, you know, what I'm going to talk about, namely the hydrodynamic scales. Nevertheless, it's a very rich family, okay? And, uh, you know, I put uh, a particle here uh, just as a generic name, but it includes uh, uh, um, uh, something like nonlinear wave equations. I mean, the quarter vector freeze equation is one member, so, you know, it's not really a doesn't fit into a particle. If I, uh, there are particle systems which are sort of Hamiltonian dynamics, but of course there are also quantum systems Then you would more call it sort of quantum many body, but you know, it's the same thing. I mean, you can have also quantum field theory. So it's, it's a rich family actually. And each one of these models are very well studied and then, you know, lots of results. And, uh, and the surprising thing which sort of has happened over the last five years is that once you go to the hydrodynamic scale, which I'm going to explain, I mean, you know, but essentially sort of means sufficiently large space time scales, then all these systems actually look alike. And that's very surprising because the underlying models are extremely diverse. You see, you have models which have continuous variables, you have models which are ultra discrete, discrete space, discrete time. I mean, also the values of the fields are discrete. Nevertheless, on the large scale, I mean, they, they look alike. And what I mean by look alike is sort of similarly like what you think about fluids. You see, if I take a fluid, um, and I write down the hydrodynamic equation, of course, you know, it, it's, it's always the same structure. Of course, the pressure is something which is very model specific. And then of course, you know, when you make predictions, I mean, you will get different things, but the equations sort of have always the same structure. And that's the same thing over here. Okay, so uh, let me start with, um, ah, no, no, it doesn't move. Okay, so let, uh, yeah, so let me start with a, with a very simple, simple case. Uh, which uh, uh, to sort of introduce sort of, you know, what I mean by hydrodynamics. So let's take a one-dimensional system and uh, let's assume that it's on not integrable. I mean, I never switch to integrable, but let's first sort of do integrable. And, and what is the hydrodynamics scale? I mean, you know, here I plotted, you have your, your, let's say at some given time, I mean, you have your spatial, uh, so which is called X, I mean, the one-dimensional space. And then the, since it's on integrable, you have sort of three conserved quantities in one dimension, which is density, momentum and energy. And so here I'm plotting, you know, a particular profile at time t. And, and now I sort of want to have slow variations. So, so this is what I call this little cell here. And in this cell, I still have a huge number of particles, but it's slow variation in the sense that when I compute any one of these conserved quantities, it will not change too much. You know, it's sort of like a smooth function when I go from one cell to the next one. So there's a slow, initially slow variation in space. But since things are conserved, you will also have slow variation in time. And therefore, you know, if you assume that this kind of local equilibrium, which is a big assumption, but you know, it seems to work in practice very well, that the system sort of likes to be in the equilibrium locally, it cannot be globally, but it likes to be locally in the equilibrium, then uh, you can actually write down uh, equations of motion, which basically govern for you, you know, the values of the, the local values of the conserved fields, in this case of these three functions. And this is sort of uh, the hydrodynamics. Now, I'm working here only on the Euler scale, so what you will see are always the sort of hyperbolic conservation laws. Of course, there's also a diffusive time scale and other things, but, uh, you know, not going to talk about that at all. Okay, so now the bold goal is to say, let's try to use the same simple intuition which we have for non-integrable system. Let's simply boldly assume that it also works for integrable system. Now, what does it mean? Well, it just means that, you know, we have to, first of all, 
you know, the central notion of equilibrium, we have to sort of generalize. But if it's sort of a standard particle system from, from uh, you know, what you need from, from what you sort of know from your physics course, it's somehow clear what to do. Because, you know, when you write down the thermal distribution, which is sort of the local equilibrium over here, it will contain the energy and here the number and maybe also the momentum. It will be just the exponential of a linear combination of the conserved quantities. Now, that simple principle, of course, I mean, Gibbs already realized, and so why don't we just generalize Gibbs in order to put now in the exponential, not only, you know, the, the two charges or, you know, two conserved fields, but many of them, and each one has its own chemical potential. And these objects, since they are such so important, uh, have been now baptized uh, GTE. I mean, it's maybe not the best name, but anyway, I mean, this is what they're called, and uh, they are called, uh, you know, GTE stands for generalized Gibbs ensemble. So Gibbs ensembles means that I'm looking at a specific system and I put in the exponential all locally conserved charges. Okay. Well, and then of course, in principle, you do the same thing. I mean, you, you sort of assume uh, local uh, that you sort of have locally GG, and then of course you get the hydrodynamic equations. Okay. Now, there's one this distinction which maybe uh, maybe I should emphasize is of course you know these local GGs now depend. You see, you this infinite number of of uh, chemical potentials, they will de depend on the infinite number of parameters, if you want to, so they depend on the full function, right? I mean, it's the same thing if you think of a power series. Okay? So one thing which I just want to point out here quickly is that, you know, uh, the, the, the Euler equations for fluids, of course, were written down by Euler. I mean, he didn't have any sort of clear microscopic picture. I mean, you know, basically had some good mechanical arguments to guess what the correct equations are. And of course, he guessed absolutely correctly. We are not in such a lucky position over here. You see, we, we, uh, we, uh, there, there's no sort of experimental evidence which we can sort of, I mean, you have to do a more and more microscopic comp uh, computation in order to find out what this, this uh, hydrodynamic, uh, what these hydrodynamic equations will be. Okay, so, uh, and now let me start with, with uh, you know, two very simple examples. I mean, so just to put your mind sort of in, in, in the right frame. And then the, the first thing is just simply the ideal gas. And where we can understand this this uh, this uh, this uh, notion of of uh, you know hydrodynamic behavior sort of very easily. I mean, so in this case, I mean, you introduce of you know this uh, counting function. Let's say at x time, I mean, we'll count you know, uh, how many particles with velocity you have in a small cell which is centered at x t, right? And so you know, then there will be uh, this this counting function. Now, this counting function is actually self-averaging because I'm assuming slow variation. And so, in a little cell, I have a huge number of particles. So when I look at one of these cells, I mean, you will a quantity which to you know to first order is just completely deterministic. It's just a number, right? And then, of course, there will be fluctuations, etc. But but this is something which has no concern here. Anyway, so so now it's, it's clear. But what what we mean by the GGE? Well, I mean, it's the fact that you know the ideal gas doesn't equilibrate to thermal equilibrium, but it will still reach the steady state with some, you know, which is uniform in space and with, uh, you know, with uh, velocities which have a particular distribution which depend on the initial conditions. And, uh, you know, statistically, if I look, I mean, I will have locally a Poisson distribution and independent identically distributed velocities and everything is sort of embodied in this, uh, in this counting function. And if you write down the equations of motion, that's of course of conservation type. And you see that the velocities are a particular simple thing. You just multiply your, your counting function with the velocity itself. Now the first complication comes when, when I look at, at this, it's almost the same thing as, as an ideal gas, but when I assume that particles have a finite diameter. So that's a model which, which is called the, the hard watt model. And so, so here I sort of shown you what, what, what it looks like. I mean, so they, they, they move and then they collide, et cetera, right? Now it's actually more convenient to think in terms of quasi particles. Quasi particles are objects which sort of maintain their velocity, you know, through the collision. And so, uh, you know, when you when you label mechanically, you would call this one and this one. But it's much better to think of the quasi particles because in the limit where L goes to zero, then I'm really back to the ideal gas dynamics, right? I mean, so this is sort of a convenient way. And uh, and, and now we, we can still introduce the counting function, just like up here, you know, I'm just counting the number of hard watts, which I see in this little fluid cell. But now all the conserved fields, are down there, the, the, the velocities are still conserved because in a collision I just exchanged. So there's still the counting function. Now, I, now the, the conserved fields suddenly become coupled because so they're coupled through the interaction. And then you have to know what is the mean velocity. So that's just the usual definition. Um, so it's not, you know, rho is the density of, of uh, locally the density of my hardware system. And now you can ask yourself, what is the analog of this equation? Now, of course, now we cannot not longer be just a linear function, but it's something more complicated, which in this field then is simply called V-effective. So V-effective 
something, some nonlinear function of, of, uh, of, the, of the counting distribution function, but it's always locally at xt, right? I mean, so xt, you sort of have to keep in your mind. I mean, whenever I write this equation, it's something which is sort of fixed. Okay, so, so, uh, so now you can wonder what this is. And then, uh, you know, there's an old paper by Jerry Kirkus who looked at this and he figured out, you know, what this equation would be. And then later on, there are proofs and all kinds of things. So this is a very well understood system. But here, just to make, you know, sure that you understand what I mean by functional, if I compute now the V effective, which of course is a function of the velocity, right? I mean, uh, and then there will be xt, which I'm suppressing in this notation, but primarily it's a function of the velocity. And now you see that it's, it's that very, in this particular nonlinear function, you know, it's not very complicated. It depends only on the first, I mean, on the, on the servos and, 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 and the first moment of the F function. But, you know, what we will discover later is that it will be a much more complicated functional of F. So once I know this functional, then I can write down my hydrodynamic equation and then I maybe can do something with it. I mean, in this talk, I will be not very much concerned with what you can actually do with, with the hydrodynamic equations. Of course, there's a huge literature, but this would you know, completely go out of my time. Uh, just at the very end, I will indicate one example. But, but the main thing is, is you know, I'm asking myself, I mean, you know, what would these type of equations look at more complicated um, integrable systems, you know, I take the delta Bose gas, but, but you know, with the famous uh, integrable system from quantum mechanics, you know, the linear delta Bose gas, so these are bosons which are sort of interact with a, with a delta type potential, I mean, very short range potential. And then the question is, you know, what, what is this V effective for, for, for that particular model? All right, so I hope that this sort of gives you a little bit sort of an idea of in which direction I want to go. And so now let's see what uh, I did as next. Ah, okay. So now comes sort of this this idea that um, uh, you know you, you want to have sort of some sort of um, uh, idea about how you could actually compute this this uh, this um, uh, this effective velocity. And 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 there's one very successful idea is that the way how you maybe are able to to figure out what this effective velocity is that you imagine that you prepare your system uh, spatially homogeneous also time independent in a particular generalized Gibbs ensemble, right? So, so it's space time stationary situation. And so, you know, I mean, of course things are moving, but statistically, you know, it would be just no, no change at all, okay? So it's, 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 it's invariant under space translation and under time translation. Okay, so this is sort of the background. And now you sort of uh, take one particle, let's say, and then you started with a particular velocity V. And then you uh, sort of follow this particle. And of course, this particle will move it will collide with, with the background particles. And so rather than moving with the bare velocity, which is in its initial velocity, and you know, if there would be no background, it would just keep going with that velocity. You have to, get, and to take into account all these collisions. Okay, so there were plenty of collisions. And the idea is that the V effective is nothing else, but, um, uh, but uh, you know, the, the, the effective velocity of this tracer particle, which depends of course on the initial velocity, which I picked, right? So uh, let's see if we're waiting to, how this works well I mean you know if I think in terms of the the, the hard rot case I mean it's very easy because uh, you know this particle is indeed just moving freely between two collisions and then it will do a jump by by the diameter either to the right and to the left etc and since the initial conditions are random you know these jumps are sort of more or less random and therefore you know in, in the long run I will see some effective definite velocity but there's a law of large number which tells you basically for whatever you know, initial conditions I take, it asymptotically I will move with a new effective velocity. And of course, you know, the, the ideal gas is sort of particularly simple, and you can work out, you know, what what the motion of the of the of this um, quasar uh, quasar uh, sort of quasar quasi particle. I mean, this object here, and then uh, of course it gives you the right result. Okay. Now, now why why is the hard watch so special? The hard watch is so special because you know how much the particle jumps in the collision is completely independent of the incoming velocities. It will always just simply by A. Now for any real, you know, sort of truly interacting many body system, it will be a, the, 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 the two particle scattering shift will depend on the two incoming velocities. So you see what, you see this model is sort of oversimplified and it doesn't have to, the, the real difficulties. The real difficulty comes from the fact that the scattering shift will depend, will be some in, in all models, a computable function that will depend on, 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 on the incoming velocities. And therefore, you know, computing this kind of object is sort of a much, much uh, more non-trivial sort of exercise. 
Okay, so uh, now, now let me say sort of a few words about, about uh, models. I'm interested to have some names. I mean, so one, one model which I like very much is the famous Toda fluid or Toda lattice. And these are particles go interacting with uh, an exponential potential. I mean, it's simply a model in which we have sort of, I mean, you know, in some sense, the best possible results at the moment anyway. So, so other famous models are, I take the Kalochero fluid, which are classical particles interacting by one over sin squared, the delta Bose gas. You know, spin change, which are integrable, quarter vector freeze, I mean, it's a box ball system, etc. I mean, you know, the list long, I just want to sort of again emphasize that, you know, despite the fact that models are fine tuned, it's a very sort of diverse family. Okay. And now we want to have, a, we do the Chi Chi counting function, I mean, uh, you know, which, which we know already. I mean, you know, that's just what we've heard in the two examples. But now there are two sort of basic questions. I mean, the first question is what do we count actually? See, before it was clear that we are just counting the velocities of the particles. But now, I, let's say I take the Kalocho model, which is a mechanical model, one over sin squared. What do I count? That's one question which I would like to answer. And then the second question, if you know what, I, what I'm counting, you know, I better know what is, what is the V effective, right? All right, so let's see whether we can make any progress. So, so I, I first shall show you a slide of, of the total lattice so that you get some visual impression. Uh, so, so this is a chain model. I mean, so, you know, it's not everybody is interacting just sort of with, uh, I mean, there's only interaction with, with particles which, which are sort of, you know, have uh, the nearest neighbor uh, uh, index here, right? Okay, so, it, it, so this one would be a particle where everybody's interacting with everyone else. But here's the chain model. So, so this is the model. And I think I want to show you some picture maybe. Yeah, the picture which I like. Oh yeah, the picture like, like this. Okay, so, so here I just want to, uh, sort of, uh, I mean, this is just, just one, one particular simulation here. You know, you start at time t equals zero, I don't know, 16 particles, and you just solve uh, uh, Newton's equation of motion. But I want, what I want to indicate to you is one thing is that, you know, I emphasize that we want to follow, well, we want to follow quasi particles. So here I start with this particular velocity, and then you see a collision, and it comes out essentially with the same one. Uh, here another collision. But now you see there's already a problem. I mean, you know, here you have many collisions. I mean, they're interacting in a complicated way. And somehow, you know, by my decision, you know, I, I color this with more or less the same velocity as this one. And here I keep going, now I come back. Now again, you know, I reach this region which sort of has enormously complicated interaction. I'm not totally sure whether this is really sort of, you know, the same one as here. But anyway, you know, I colored uh, some trajectory. So what I want to say is that while the, the notion of gray side particle sort of is very useful. You see that once I come to a strongly interacting system when it's very dense, I mean, and some of you would think that it sort of loses its validity. I don't know, they didn't end. We will see that it's not so bad, but uh, I just want to convince you that if you are in a very dilute, you know, so here you see a very nice uh, two particle, you know, isolated collision between two particles. I mean, they, they have sufficient energy so that they could cross, but then, you know, they just essentially keep, uh, exit with the same velocity. But in general, we have complicated things. And, you know, the idea that I could identify what I mean by quasi particle is sort of a little bit over optimistic. All right, so now, now let's see whether, whether we can do make some progress here. And, and so, uh, so now I sort of go to something which sort of looks first like sort of totally different from, 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 uh, from what, what I'm interested in, namely this hydrodynamic scale. But then nevertheless, it, it's sort of a, a background with, with, which is actually quite important. And so let me sort of discuss for you what I call here the, the, the hallmark of integrability. And uh, of course, you know, there's, uh, you know, there are all kinds of hallmarks which you can sort of identify, you know, the beta answers maybe or other important things. But I mean, let me do this thing which I think everybody agrees and which is sort of generically available, namely, um, I, I just do scattering theory. So which is, of course, very far away from, from uh, from a hydrodynamic situation, because now I'm looking at the infinite line and particles can sort of, you know, uh, ex basically can expand out to infinity, right? And so, so the thing which I want to emphasize is that the way how it looks uh, for an integrable system is that, uh, so here I have sort of, you know, this configuration at, at minus infinity where particles are very far apart and they sort of come, and come in with these particular momenta or velocities. And then, of course, there, there's a huge region where, you know, what we just saw. I mean, there's a complicated interaction, which, which you know, it's, it's very difficult to follow uh, sort of the quasi particles. But if I wait long enough, so, you know, that's sort of what people call the time of flight method. I mean, you, you isolate your system and then you wait long enough and then you see what you see. Then you will see, again, you know, outgoing velocities. And because the system is integrable, there will be nothing else 
But um, uh, you know, if I do this labeling, just a reversal of, 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 of this initial configuration. And uh, if I do quasi particles, I could say that you know, what is actually conserved is the velocity of the quasi particles, right? I mean, you know, it's this quasi particle, which has a particle label three, which, which is the, the same object as over the same quasi particle. But on top of having an asymptotic velocities, they will be shifted by order one. And that's the two particle scattering shift. Okay, so, so, so here I'm, I've written down a few formulas. I mean, so, you know, I look at the position of particle number J. This will be the asymptotic velocity, which I call the lambda J. And then there will be a shift of order one. And then here time goes to infinity. And I do the same thing for minus infinity, but I already do the quasi particle. I mean, so I do already the reverse labeling. So this is sort of just uh, comes, comes from the integrability. And then there will be another shift, which I call phi j minus. Okay. Now, the central quantity in this object are not the scattering shifts by themselves, but they're different. I mean, that's sort of an intrinsic property of the model, right? Otherwise, you know, the scattering shifts depend very much on the initial condition. But now, the, if I just take the difference, I mean, something which, which only depends on the intrinsic property of the system. And so then you find this very beautiful formula that the scattering shift, you know, is sort of so, so it's, it's, um, Okay, so, so first, first I, I introduce already the two particle scattering shift. This, in this model, it's just very easy. I just start with two particles and then I look what they do and then, then I sort of work out from elementary mechanics what is the two particle scattering shift. So that, that's sort of what we can do in many cases. I mean, so, so that, that, that's something which is known. But then the point is that when I look now at the n particle system, then the scattering shift is just a sum, sign sum. I mean, there's a sign here, sign sum of the two particle scattering shift. And the way to understand this is just sort of, you know, you, you look at uh, independent particles and you just sound, sound, uh, you know, just look at the collisions they have. And now you remember that the shift is sort of depending on, on the, the incoming velocities. And then you arrive this formula. Or, you know, you can sort of uh, appeal with big names. I mean, Yang Bax, so I mean, so, so, you know, here you have this, this scattering shift of through particles. And the main point is that no matter how you, in which order these collisions appear, you know, you will always get the same result. I mean, that's sort of embodied with this correlation. Right? Okay, so, so this is something which, which, you know, I say hallmark because um, in many, many systems uh, of integrable systems, I mean, you come, uh, somehow um, have this knowledge. But now comes the surprise. You see, um, when, when you look at this picture, of course, if I do this for the total particles, it's actually a famous theorem of Morse. I mean, who actually proved this kind of picture. So in this case, you know, you have the particles. But if I look at the KDV, which is a which a, uh, which is a, a nonlinear wave equation, then uh, your basic objects are actually the solitons. I mean, the famous solitons, which is sort of an extended uh, sort of wave bump, which sort of uh, you know uh, as they interact, two solitons interact. It's something very complicated. But if you wait, if you do this time of flight method, actually they will separate, and you will have exactly the 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 the, the, the hallmark of integrability. So you see that, that the models which I sort of listed fall into two classes. One of them are what I call particle-based, the solitons. And uh, excuse me for this kind of terminology, but you know, the people who are attached to, to them, I mean, they, they think of solitons something different. But in our context, it's clear that the solitons are simply the individual particles. You know, they scatter and they have this kind of, the, the, the show the hallmark. But if I look at another system, which, so these I call particle based. I mean, typically, you know, this, these are the mechanical models or the, 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 you know, also the quantum mechanical models. They, they are all particle based. I can, can also look soliton based, right? So the elementary objects are solitons. I mean, they are very stable quantities and they have exactly the same feature. When they collide, I don't know, I cannot separate them. But if I do the time of flight, if I wait long enough, they separate and they move nicely as sort of individual particles. So here I put one picture from, from the KDV soliton gas. I mean, so you have these two bumps. I mean, they're moving on the line. In this case, they cannot move backwards. I mean, they all have positive velocities. But, uh, you know, you, you see the, the, the very narrow high guy. I mean, he's moving fast. And then there's a slow guy, which is sort of a little bit fat and moving uh, very, uh, very slowly. And then it will be overtaken by, 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 the, by, the, so by the fast guy. And, and uh, of course, in the middle, you know, intermediate, you see all these funny things. But then if you wait, I mean, they will nicely separate. and. and the, one has sort of been overtaken to. Okay. So that means that we must have hydrodynamics either based on, on particles or based on solitons. And for the total, that is actually we can do both. And there are other models for which you can do both. Now you might think, you know, there's presumably contradiction because I mean the hydrodynamic equations 
you know, they have the same structure, but they are certainly different because uh, the two particle scattering will be totally different. But the point is that, that uh, you know, it's just a question of initial conditions, right? I mean, if I, you know, if I want to prepare the soliton gas for the torta, I have to do very special initial conditions, which are very different from the one which I would do for the particles. It's not a TGE, right? Okay, so now let's see uh, what I wanted to say. Ah, okay, so now comes sort of uh, the big, the big uh, uh, sort of uh, step forward in this, this whole theory, which actually has a somewhat funny history, but let me first explain the formula and then, then um, um, then I, I, I can say more about it. Okay, so so here is so, so 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 here is the claim that there is actually a formula for the effective velocity, and I like to call this collision weight ansatz because you know when you see my explanation, you see that it, it's pretty much hand waving, right? I mean, so you know I, I call it ansatz that you know it sounds plausible, but but you know when it first sounds plausible, then you think a second time about it, then you think it's just can be cannot be possibly true. And then you think even more, and then you realize that it is actually true. I mean, so it's something of that sort, okay? So, so what is the answer? Well, you just say that, okay, so I want to compute the effective velocity. Well, one thing I know is that we'll just sort of, uh, you know, move with its bare velocity if there's no background. Okay, that's easy. Now you ask yourself, uh, you know, it's sort of, it, it's colliding with other particles, which sort of, you know, I given here the label W, which we don't know yet exactly what it is, but, uh, you know, with other objects, I mean, other quasar particles which have uh, some velocity w. So, so this is sort of, you know, how much I see in the background. I mean, that, that's sort of the counting function of the GGE. Okay, so once, once, uh, once you make a collision, I mean, then you jump. And, and I emphasize that it depends on both velocities. I mean, you know, the quasar particle you're actually looking at and the one which comes from the background fluid. I mean, so this is my phi of v and w, okay? And now you want to know how many collisions do I have per unit time? Uh, the naive thing would be to say, well, you know, I have two particles with sort of with, with uh, two different velocities, and then of course it just depends on the velocity difference, right? But that would be not such a good idea because, you know, in some sense they are really moving with an effective velocity on the on the course scale, and therefore what I simply do boldly is to say, well, okay, I can compute the weight, you know, as I would do for two particles, which is simply, but now they are simply moving with an effective velocity. So, uh, you know, the naive thing would be just to put here. W minus V, that would be, you know, uh, an approximation, but the true thing is to put here also the effective uh, V effective, okay? And then uh, you see that I get a nice equation. Actually, it turns out to be a linear equation. So, you know, if you think sort of monomerically, I mean, it's something which presumably you are able to compute, right? I mean, at least sort of you can write a program and they'll sort of do it for you. So, so you know, it has sort of some, some uh, feature of simplicity if you want some. So. Okay, so now what is the history of this, this formula? Well, I mean, so, so it goes back to Chinadi L. I mean, uh, he sort of came from the Soliton community and uh, this was 2003. I mean, and, and he, he was thinking about something which was, you know, in this community was sort of known. I mean, people talk about Soliton gases and, and uh, there was also sort of already the idea of, you know, what kind of equation you should get when you have a very low density. Uh, so this was something which was sort of uh, found by by Zaharov, and uh, so uh, so Chinadi was sort of linking along these lines, and uh, he, he used sort of a technique which which uh, you know I just put the name here, and uh, you know it, it's a long computation, and at the end of the computation he comes up with two coupled equation for certain quantities which appear in this derivation, right? And uh, then you stare at them, and of course you don't really know exactly what you're doing with these things, and then you stare again. And at some point you realize that you can reformulate these two equations into this one. And this is what he wrote in his paper. And, you know, he emphasized already, you know, sort of the, the, this intuitive picture that, you know, this sounds like a, like a reasonable thing, okay? Now, this was work which was, was completely confined to the Soliton people. And then uh, I don't think, you know, any, anybody outside the community actually picked it up. Even in the Soliton community, Soliton gases sort of, you know, were investigated much, much later really. But then there came those, so those people from, from uh, sort of quantum anybody who somehow knew already, you know, they had a big experience with CGE and they somehow wanted to figure out, I mean, how they get uh, this kind of effective velocity. And, 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 and so, so they somehow, you know, also derived this formula or, or guess the formula anyway. So, and then, then I, there, there's a sort of more recent paper where we do something uh, it's totally different, which sort of looks, again, I mean, you know, it looks like something which, which wouldn't give you the formula, but at the end, I mean, you, you reformulate and then you find this. Okay, so this, this is sort of the, the, the central point. 
And um, uh, let me see, I have to watch a little bit on my time here. And so, so now, now I want to say a few words about, uh, uh, about uh, the, the next issue, what, what is the counting function? Now the counting, what is the W in the counting function? Now, now the W in the counting function depends very much on the model. So of course I can just display one model. And so, so uh, this is sort of uh, what you would do for the, for the TODA. So here I've written down the Hamiltonian. Here's the boundary condition, which fixes the free volume between the particles. And then the amazing thing, which is true in many other models is that there's a lax matrix, which sort of is a three to three triangle matrix is arranged like this. And the main point about this lax matrix is that when you compute the eigenvalues of the lax matrix, then uh, uh, this gives you conserved quantities. And so now you know what W is. You see, it's a somewhat non-trivial and what I call the lax filter. I mean, you look at your little volume element, you see positions and momenta, and you don't see anything which is conserved, so to speak, right? But what you have to do is you have to take this microscopic information, you stuck it into the lax matrix, you compute the eigenvalues, and these are the slow invariant quantities. And so what you have to count is actually the density of states, I mean, you know, the density of the eigenvalues of that lax matrix. You see, it's something slightly different than velocities. It's only equal to the velocities if I remove the off diagonal terms. I mean, then of course it's exactly the same as the velocities because you know, then the eigenvalues are just the momentum. Okay, so, so this is sort of the, the, the crucial insight that the, that the slowly varying quantity is the density of states of the lax matrix. You know? Otherwise you see a lot of noise, but this one is changing slowly. And for this, you will have this, this, uh, this uh, generalized high, uh, this um, hydrodynamic equation. And now you, you wonder how you can actually see it. And of course, you know, this is sort of a more mathematical description, but people do real experiments. And when they do real experiments, I mean, then you use always the time of flight method, right? I mean, so if you want to know, if you want to know what is your, your counting function, you take a little volume element, you separate it from, from the output, it sort of in, in infinite system, you separate it from the outside, you wait, and then you just see. And this is what they do for delta Bose gas. That's the way how you do it. Okay, and then because it, it depends on the model, I mean, the W has different names, but let me not go into this too much. I mean, so let's see what else I want to say. Okay, so, so I guess that's sort of um, the last, last um, uh, before showing some, some you guys, sort of the last slides with this formula. I mean, so, so let me sort of, you know, jump sort of, you know, very much ahead by explaining to you what can you do with once you have sort of figured out the hydrodynamic equation? And I explain you this in the case of the of the of of, of the Toda lattice. And uh, you see, because I have this this lax eigenvalue, sort of I know what what these locally conserved quantities are. Of course, there are some complicated functional phase space that's not so very helpful, but there are the eigenvalues of that lax matrix. Now, and then what I want to study are the space-time correlations in thermal equilibrium. So you know the standard quantity which which anybody in statistical mechanics would like to do. And the non-indicable system, this happens to be extremely simple. I mean, you know, I have three conserved quantities. I will see three delta peaks, which are just moving out uh, with the speed of sound. And one is sitting in the middle. And of course, you know, the, the main focus is then actually looking at the broadening. But, but since I'm working on the Euler scale, you know, it, it would be this boring picture, which I see for non-indicable system, nothing more. It just reflects the fact that I have three conserved quantities, right? And then the speed of sound. Okay, now, of course, if we, if we go to the integrable thing, I mean, it becomes more interesting because, uh, you know, I, now I have an infinite number of conserved quantities. So if you want to, for, for each conserved quantity, I get here a peak. And so I have sort of, you know, an infinite uh, number of peaks and they eventually form a very broad spectrum. Okay, and so then you say, okay, I mean, let's, let's simply check this. I, I'm on the Euler scale. So, you know, this broad spectrum will scale ballistically. So, you know, will depend only on X, of, X and T. And uh, it will have particular shapes. Now, can I predict these shapes? Well, I mean, that's sort of a question whether I can do that. But, uh, you know, what I really would have to compute is, you know, the true, uh, so the average is thermal equilibrium. But, you know, here I get a sort of, you know, an infinite dimension matrix where I have here the M's conserved quantity, here at the N's conserved quantity, this one at the origin, and this one at, at J time T. So I'm perturbing. The equilibrium state, you know, with, with the ends conserved locally, with the density of the ends conserved field, and then I'm sort of probing it, you know, with the density of, of the ends conserved field at, at time t h a. Okay, this will be certainly not exactly uh, scale invariant, but if I go to the hydrodynamic scale, I predict sort of, you know, the leading term, which is sort of, uh, which is, which varies on the ballistic scale. And now you can, you know, based on this hydrodynamic equation, you can do sort of a Landau-Lipschitz type theory, and what you find is that actually 
you know, it, it's related to the, to the linearized hydrodynamic equations. And the solutions of this linearized hydrodynamic equation have such, such a particular formula. I mean, uh, you know, maybe I, I don't have to go much into it, but what you see here, the, 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 the mode sort of propagating with this effective velocity. And then there's a weighting which comes from, you know, which kind of particular field I'm using. And so I guess I just want to show you some, some picture. I mean, so, so uh, I mean, there's an early work by, 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 uh, uh, by Kundu and, and, and Abhishek, um, which uh, did, did, this is, did this kind of uh, simulations. And uh, um, uh, you know, they have very nice pictures, but you know, they, did, they did it sort of like two years earlier. I mean, they couldn't compare it with CHD. Now we have new pictures. And I just want to show to you, you know, how these uh, pictures from, from, from the molecular dynamics actually do match with the prediction from linearized hydrodynamics. And this just to give you an idea, I mean, you know, the, the, the numbers which I have are sort of pretty much conventional. I mean, we take sufficiently large system, 4,000 particles times that you actually see the ballistic scaling. I mean, if I do, would do a time or 100, I wouldn't see it, but 600 is okay, five, five million samples. And uh, okay, and so I just want to show you the picture and then make some comments. And then I'm done. Okay, so so this this is now for 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 set of parameters. I mean, so here uh, the inverse temperature is fixed; it's 0 0.5. And and uh, here you're you're plotting, you know, the, the, this broad spectrum. I mean, this is sort of scaled on the ballistic scale. There are, there are no adjustable parameters. You see, we really take the data on top of the formula which we get from from GHD. I mean, you know, there is no free parameter whatsoever. And, uh, and you know what, what you should basically see at that point, I mean, is that you know things do agree very nicely, and and, and now you you increase the pressure or the free volume, and then you see that it sort of starts to forming, and then uh, this is sort of the highest value. And uh, uh, let me sort of show the next one. I mean, you know, it will be not will be sort of something similar. This is sort of a, at a somewhat somewhat lower pressure, so the beta is equal to one, and there's another one. I mean, just to convince you. And uh, you know, it, it doesn't depend on which parameter I'm looking. The other things we measured also the often angle elements, I mean, you know, the cross correlations and the same picture. Okay, so the conclusion is that in this very particular case, which is presumably the, 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 the sort of, you know, the, the, the precision of, of this, uh, of, this uh, how to, of this hydrodynamic equation, which have sort of the, the highest precision at the moment, you know, I mean, the, the, if you make the effort, uh, then, uh, you know, the agreement is, is Pretty good. I mean, it's order a percent or two percent, right? Okay, so let me stop here, and and I want to sort of point out. I know I want to point out one thing here. Uh, maybe I should have done that before, uh, if I may. I mean, so 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 you might wonder. Maybe let's do, let's go back to this one. I mean, so you might wonder what 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 are these three things? You see, I mean, this you cannot see, but you know, this thing is actually a, a very exciting point because at this point, you know, for this particular beta, the density of particles is essentially infinity. Now your computer knows that, and your comp no, 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 the microscopic dynamics doesn't know that. I mean, it's okay. But your generalized hydro, you know, your GHD, when you do the computation there for these effective things, the computer knows and, and it just cannot reach that point exactly. So you have to either approach it from the left or from the right. But the point is that, that you know, at, at, if you are sitting at this point, I mean, the particles are extremely dense. And so the idea, you know, to write down this, this collision rate ansatz, which is sort of based on some sort of law of large numbers and things sort of effective collision sounds completely crazy. And so, of course, I was initially worried that, that you know, maybe at this point, I mean, the, the, the high generalized hydrodynamics just breaks down completely. But the result of the numerics is that, and, and also our proofs, because, you know, the proofs are not based on, on, on this picture. I mean, they, they, they use a totally different sort of machinery. The point is that, you know, as you can see from the pictures, I mean, uh, nothing really actually happens. It's, it's completely smooth. And then, you know, despite the fact that the particles are so close, I mean, they are all the one over square root anyway. I mean, so they're really very close. I mean, you know, in terms of the hydrodynamic uh, evolution equations, I mean, uh, it, 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 it's still, you know, the theory still holds. I mean, so this collision rate, rate ansatz holds even under very extreme conditions. Okay, so now I'm, I'm finished and I want to say two words about, uh, uh, the thing I mean, so first one which I didn't mention is that uh, in all these formulas, you know, there are sort of there are variational formulas, and, and because there's a variational principle, you know, there are corresponding Euler Lagrange equations, which in this community are called the TBA, also the, the thermodynamic beta ansatz formalism. So, so that, that's always behind everything. You know, the point is that, you know, this simplifies somehow the whole thing and makes it uh, computationally accessible. And the other thing which I want to which I want to recommend is, is a very nice review article by Bushul. I mean, uh, 
she's, she's an experimentalist, uh, I guess, in Osei and then Sharon Dubai, and they sort of collected all the work on, on the Delta Bose gas. And it's a very nice article because you have sort of half of it, sort of model theory, which is very instructive if you're more interested in the theoretical developments, but there's another half which sort of goes uh, more to the experimental side, which sort of started in sort of 2000, I don't know, 05. I mean, that's this Newton's cradle experiment. I mean, you know, you have these atoms and, and, and you give them uh, a velocity, we, you kick them, they sit in a harmonic potential and then these two clouds are sort of bouncing back and forth without actually deforming. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Herbert. Questions? Uh, question, yeah. Uh, there, uh, the idea of this local equilibrium reflects in the relationship between transport coefficients. In, so there, it's just a normal uh, Gibbs ensemble kind of equilibrium. Uh, here, for the integrable case where you have GG, what, is there such similar relation which is equivalent of the fluctuation dissipation relation? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so, so this is something, I mean, uh, I guess, Benjamin de Jong and, and Jacob, I mean, they analyzed and they asked the question, what, what, uh, uh, you know, is there a diffusive, I mean, Navier-Stokes type correction, I mean, which, you know, on the level of, of the equation just means that there's, you know, a second derivative in X, right, I'm hearing. I mean, I only had first derivatives in X, right? And the answer is yes. I mean, you know, they all, all the usual things which you sort of know about things, all the sum rules, I mean, uh, uh, are satisfied. I mean, uh, there's Green-Kuber formula. I mean, they have sort of, in some sense, uh, explicit expressions for the, for the diffusion coefficients, right? I mean, so, uh, now of course, you know, they depend on, 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 on doing this, this TBA so, I mean, so you would have to compute them numerically. There are no, no, I mean, one thing which, which uh, has never been attempted, I mean, you know, uh, I, mean, I have no idea of how quickly these correlation functions actually decay. I mean, you know, I, I think it would be a nice simulation to actually investigate in, in some of, I mean, for instance, for the TODA, where you also have predictions how these how this time correlations actually decay in time, because, you know, I mean, they should be integrable. So, so what I'm trying to say, I mean, you know, all the indication which we have is that that uh, for this integrable model, the first order of correction is sort of regular diffusion. I mean, there's no anomalous bands for it. Hi. So is it possible to get fractional derivatives in the hydrodynamical description some, somehow in these kinds of systems? No, I didn't understand. Fractional derivatives, you know, uh, non-integer derivatives in the hydrodynamical description, is it possible to get them in these kinds of models? Somebody has uh, <laughs> non-integer non derivatives. Oh, the fractional derivative. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but this is what I was just trying to say. I mean, uh, you know, no, I mean, at least, you know, I mean, this is sort of, uh, no, sort of little explored territory. I mean, let's put it this way, okay? And the point is that, that the, the convection, no, it's always just you know, no fractional, no, no, no fractional derivatives. I mean, just second order derivatives and, and standard sort of, uh, you know, Gaussian type of fluctuation theory. I mean, uh, so, so, uh, so, yeah, it, 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 that's what it looks like, right? I mean, so, uh, um, so, so usually these fractional derivatives come because, you know, we look at integrable models in one dimension and then they have all this sort of funny transport behavior. I mean, here we are in one dimension, but, but it's integrable. And so it, it, that's a current indication, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Good morning. Can, can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Good morning. So I have a very sort of very general question. Everything is one dimensional always. Is that right? Or does is there any any are there any cases where you can do anything similar in higher dimensions? Well, uh, short short answer. I'm afraid is simply no. Right. I mean, you see, the, the, the point is that, that uh, I mean, you want to have a system which, which has, uh, uh, I mean, an extensive number of conservation laws. And that, that sort of, you know, th th that's very difficult to do in higher dimensions. You know, when you, when you go to the literature, I mean, you know, there are always sort of claims that some of these things, I mean, uh, you know, maybe you can also have in higher dimensions. But when you go actually to the paper, you realize that, uh, you know, maybe it's a small step, but but you know, it, it's far away from from anything, you know, like 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 hydrodynamics or so. You know, and she, I mean, all these things are sort of linked to to one dimension. I mean, yeah. 
but, but so it's, it's 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 more about the number of conservation laws yeah. rather than the geometry of collisions or anything like that. Yeah, no, no, no. You see, I mean, the, the point is, it, it, uh, yeah. I mean, you see, the, the, this this you could see. I mean, that's a good point. I mean, so I can explain this. You see, you you, you might ask, you know, what what come, what 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 have what, when I look at this, you know, what what I called, uh, you know, the the, the, the this, this scattering picture. I mean, you know, sort of uh, the hallmark of integrability. Uh, you could do the same thing in one dimension uh, this for non-integrable systems, right? I mean, how would it change? I mean, the main point would it change is that, you know, the, 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 the asymptotic velocities are a very complicated function of the incoming velocities. And it's the integrability which, which makes this relation so simple, right? So, so in that sense, yeah, I, it's, it's the integrability which is sort of, you know, inherited in everything, yeah. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Um, if I understood well, you told us that the, the eigenvalues of the lax pair, the lax matrix, are the right quantities to, con to consider. And yes. the density of states. Yes. But you can choose the lax pair in a different way. There is a gauge invariance. Is, is there a good choice ah. of the lax matrix? I mean, how does the, the, the freedom of choice of the lax matrix? Ah, that's an interesting uh, question, yes. Uh, it itself in the equation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so okay, so what uh, what Kiron is referring to is that that uh, you know you have one system, but uh, but you know you have some choice of the lax matrix. Okay, so uh, okay, I, I I can only give a vague answer, but but you see that the, the central point is that so you you look at the lax matrix, so you get a conserved quantity. Now, uh, for hydrodynamics, it's absolutely essential that. Um, uh, when you look, you know, the conserved quantities is sort of an extensive object, right? But uh, you want for hydrodynamics, you want to have that this quantity has a density and that density should be something which is local or at least quasi-local. And so if you choose the wrong lax matrix, you might get a non-local density and then, then that's ruled out. And so at least sort of in the few cases, which I know, uh, it, it's, it's that condition of locality which forces you a particular lax matrix. We are facing some kind of similar problem, and the choice of the lax pair is important. Yeah. So, so here, I mean, okay, I mean, you know, it, it's sort of more, I mean, not, not, not so much studied, but but at least when you look at concrete examples, you, you always pick the one which 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 produces for you local density or quasi local densities. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah, so you gave us a lot of evidence for V effective is a, an important thing. And, you know, there are equations and answers. Is, yeah. But is, uh, it's the effective velocity of something. Is that something properly defined or always, no. or is it fuzzy? Okay, so, okay. so when, you look at the, when you look at this, uh, what I call collision weight answers, it's totally fuzzy. Right, except for limiting cases where you can actually really identify or for hard words for a particular model. But in general, it's just totally fuzzy. I don't really know what I'm talking about, okay? On the other side, there's something which is absolutely, totally unambiguous. You see, when I take the TODA uh, lattice, let's say, then I have locally conserved quantities, so I can write down what are the microscopic currents. These are very explicit formulas, right? I mean, you know, of course, depend a little bit more on the eigenvalues, but, but uh, on, on the eigenvectors, but you know, there are still, you know, explicit formulas, sort of algebraically explicit formulas, okay? Now, the point is that, you know, what, 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 I, what, I, might, what I mean by the V effective, when you see how it looks, how it comes into equations, so if I take V effective times F, this should be nothing else but the, the GGE average of the microscopic currents. And you see in, in, in the work which I quoted, that's the definition which we take. And of course, everybody else who's working in the field, you know, people working on the Delta Bose gas, I mean, what, the, what they want to do is exactly the same program. I mean, you first write down what the currents are, you know, this, this typically, you know, I mean, at least sort of, you know, we have some formulas, but then the difficult thing is to do the GGE average of those quantities. And it's difficult because they are, you see, when you look at the, the average of the conserved fields, I mean, once you know the free energy, which I haven't really talked about, but you know, that, that's something which is behind this variational formula, then when you take derivatives of the free energy, I mean, then you get the average values of the conserved fields. 
So that's one half of the hydrodynamic equations. But you also need the average of the covens. That's the other half of the hydrodynamic equation. And for this, you know, there, there's the, it's a more complicated average. It's not a derivative of free, of free energy. It depends on, on the eigenvectors of your Lex matrix. And so it's a difficult problem. That, that's why it was sort of unsolved for such a long time. So there is a very well-defined object, which everybody agrees upon, right? And, and, and you know, this collision weight ansatz, I mean, that's sort of a strange thing. I mean, which appears in basically all of these models. You know, you, 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 you turn the crank. I mean, you, somehow in your model, you, you succeed to write down a formula, which has nothing to do with the collision weight ansatz. So you sort of look at it. I mean, you, you, you see no identity. I mean, you simply it just look very different, OK? But then you take that particular expression, you put it into the collision weight ansatz, and you realize that it solves the collision weight ansatz. But reading up posterior is sort of confirm and confirmation that that's the right thing. Uh, yes. Uh, so this the, the derivation of this uh, current at the Euler scale has it been done from microscopics? Like can it be derived from microscopics, or has it been done before? You mean deriving the, the hydrodynamic equation? Yes, at the Euler scale. Well, I mean, I think you, you can do it only, only, only for the hard watts. I mean, everything beyond. I mean, that, I mean, okay, I should be more careful. I mean, people trying to sort of, you know, also confirm, you know, from from certain sort of computations. I mean, sort of the the that the, the, you know the, the full dynamical picture. But that's something which which is you know very much work in progress, so to speak. I mean, in some cases, people claim. I mean, you. You listen to Benjamin Noyon, then then you know, he he will tell you that that for the delta Bose gas, he sort of knows more or less how to do that. Uh, but but uh, this is work uh, very much in progress. And this is so. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, unless there is an urgent question, uh, 